Josh Bell. Yeah. With each passing month, little James Leidegger seemed to be peeling back memories of a past life. Vivid memories that scared and astonished his parents. Chris had always said, what kind of plane did you fly? He said, a Corsair. He said, a Corsair? He said the word Corsair. Not only did James remember flying a Corsair, he demonstrated knowledge of the plane's peculiarities. At the time, he was flipping through a book about planes when he was four. When he got to the Corsair, he said, that's a Corsair. And he goes, you know what? Things to get flat tires all the time. In fact, historians and pilots agree that the plane's tires took a lot of punishment on landing. Of course, this is a fact that could easily be found in books or on TV. But then, James began to offer up the kinds of specific details his parents say are harder to explain away. Uh, another night, Bruce had come in and he said, Do you remember where your plane took off? And he said it took off of a boat. Do you remember the name of your boat? Natoma. Do you remember what your name was? And he'd always say, James. But his name is James. It never it really occurred to us. We thought he just wasn't understanding the question. So I said, do you remember any friends or anyone else that you flew with? And he said, Jack. Jack Larson. Bruce began doing some research. Almost immediately, he discovered that the Natoma was an actual ship, a small aircraft carrier in the Pacific called the Natoma Bay. And Jack Larson, the Navy buddy little James recalled, well, it turns out there was a pilot named Jack Larson who served aboard the Natoma Bay. In fact, he's alive and well and living in Arkansas. And it was like holy mackerel. I mean, really, you could have poured my brains out of my ears. And I just, I just couldn't believe it. And there were more clues. Around this time, James began signing crayon drawings and other artwork. James III. One day I asked him why he's calling himself James III. Well, this was on the third James. And every once in a while, he'd ask him that today, and he'll still say the same thing. And one day, while leafing through a new book about the Battle of Iwo Jima, Bruce turned to an aerial photo of the Pacific Island. James was seated nearby. He pointed to it, and he goes, Daddy, that's where my airplane was shot down. And, and I said, what? It's, that's my airplane that got shot mm -hmm. down there, Daddy. And I just went, well, uh, I just went blank. Uh, I, I, did, I, I, I couldn't say anything. By then, Bruce had become a man possessed, searching the internet, combing through military records, and interviewing men who served aboard the Natoma Bay. Finally, a breakthrough. He learned that there was just one pilot in the squadron killed at Iwo Jima. That pilot? James M. Houston, Jr. Is this why little James was calling himself James III? It just crystallized in my mind. This, this has to be who we're talking about. You know, my meter of skepticism was starting to go over toward belief. When little James would describe being shot down, he told them how his plane had sustained a direct hit on the engine. We had an airplane, and I said, well, can you show me where it was? And he, he pointed right up to the front of the engine. That's what makes this man's story so intriguing. His name is Ralph Carver. Carver was a rear gunner on a TBM Avenger that flew off the Natoma Bay. On March 3rd, 1945, he took part in a raid near Iwo Jima. As it happens, Carver's plane was right next to the one flown by James M. Houston, Jr. It was to be Hugh's last mission before leaving for home the following day. As Carver recalls, the sky was thick with nearly black. We experienced a uh, pretty heavy anti-traffic fire, but uh, this was the most intense that I experienced uh, at, at any time. Suddenly, a flash saw the hit. I would say he was hit head on. Yeah, right on the middle of the engine. Just as little James had described it. So what do you believe now about your son James? I believe that he had a past life. I believe that his, in his past life he was James M. Houston Jr. Uh, and he came back because he wasn't finished with something. Uh, that's essentially what I believe. Dear Bruce and Andrea. And he's not the only one. This past October, the Leinigers received a letter from a woman named Ann Barron, the sister of pilot James Houston. Andrea and Bruce had contacted her about their little boy. Barron heard about what young James was saying, and she believes. All of this is still overwhelming. I can only imagine how it has affected you, but I believe, with my love to you, Ann. The child was so convincing and coming up with all these things that there's no way in the world he could know, unless there is a spiritual thing. I 
think that the parents are self-deceived, that they're fascinated by the mysterious, and they've built up a fairy tale. Professor Paul Kurtz at the University of Buffalo heads an organization that investigates claims of the paranormal. He's overhearing conversations of his parents. He's looking at cues. Uh, he may talk to his, his little friends or hear from neighbors. And then this conviction that builds up that, yes, he was this pilot. And, yes, he will come to believe that himself. Do you ever rack your brain and say, gee, I hope I, hope I didn't say anything or do anything that put this in James' head? Do you ever question yourself? No, no, no. no. Because I'm really talking to a two-year-old. You know, I mean, what am I going to do? Send him in a course and listen, now we're going to concoct this elaborate scheme. And you're going to imagine that you went through those things. I knew what he watched on television. I knew what stories I read to him. I'm a protective, first-time Southern mother. There was no other place he could have been getting this information. Assuming the line is acting in good faith, what we have here is a classic conflict of faith versus science. Hard facts against beliefs that often can't be easily explained. There's no doubt where Paul Kurtz stands. People have a right to believe, surely, in America, freedom of conscience. On the other hand, do you want to believe in something that is false? <coughs> so how do you rationalize a belief in anything bigger than ourselves if you have to fall back on science all the time? Uh, not simply science, on the facts, on common sense. Once upon a time, the Leinigers might have agreed. That was before the amazing stories told by their young son forced them to consider the possibilities and to examine their faith. Whether you believe in reincarnation or not, it's about the eternal life of the human spirit. And that's something God promises to us. There is something else out there after this. It's not over when you die. James's vivid recollections are starting to fade as he gets older. But among his prized possessions are two gifts sent to him by pilot James Houston's sister a bust of George Washington, and a model of a Corsair aircraft. They were among the personal effects of James Houston, sent home after the war. Do you feel differently about James? Has this changed your relationship with him? No. no. We, we have always felt that he's a special little boy because he's our son. Uh, he appears to have experienced something that I don't think is unique, but the way it's been revealed is quite astounding. assumption that it's just Buddhists and Hindus who believe in reincarnation, but would it surprise you to know that one out of every four Americans, Christians and Jewish alike, believe that souls do return again in different bodies? We'll be right back. Uh, no, I'm going to like make a comment or two, and we can uh, open it to, to discussion. There's a couple of... It's okay. You can turn turn it back off of that now. Yeah, no, turn it to me now. Okay, that's all right. I'm, I'm just two, two things. One is there's a popular misconception that karma and reincarnation is a religious thing, but it really isn't. It's a law of nature. That's okay. And the second, uh, the second thing is. There are an increasing number of scientists that are becoming convinced, uh, this traditional scientists like um, Dr. Stevenson and a colleague of his, a uh, um, laureate uh, from from the University of Georgia uh, down that way in Athens. So, and we all know, we all understand uh, in this group anyway, uh, the, the process of Reincarnation, karma, evolution, etc. So with that, uh, we will op you know close the discussion from the platform and open it to the floor. Questions, comments, and question. Uh huh. Um, there's something for strange uh, and I'm kind of curious. The curling in photography is supposed to be able. Um, to capture the um, electromagnetic force around uh, an object. Uh, and I've seen pictures of a leaf, and, you know, they've taken pictures and seen the sort of the light around it until you cut the, the leaf to the degree that there's maybe a more than a third that's missing, and then that 
life force sort of comes in, sort of an aura. It, to your knowledge, is there anything that's been done scientifically with being able to use the Kirlian photography or uh, some type of technology to be able to measure uh, the energy around uh, a, a being, uh, you know, especially when the being drops the body, you know, uh, whether that life force is still present? Anything like that? I've actually heard people uh, talk about trying to do that, um, and from time to time people have popped up and talked about it. So in, I think it's happening, uh, the, the way this student understands it, that there are people who are, are to a, at least some degree, being able to do what you're suggesting, that, uh, that, that uh, it is coming out in photography. And then the other thing is, um, uh, how can it benefit one, pardon me, to know their past lives? Um, that is a question <laughs> that really has come up uh, quite a bit before, and you, you know that, you probably know that too, that's why you ask it. Um, it's very important for us to understand that we are making our bed for the future, not only our bed, but the bed of all, all of humanity, all of, all of nature, really, because we, can ha we are having an impact on nature. It's hard to understand it sometimes, that how, what our link is with the tsunami, etc. But everything occurs to teach us a lesson, a karma, part of it. It occurs to teach us a lesson and we get into the different types of karma, the individual karma, the national karma, etc. So, you know, we are, we are, we're setting the scene for the future, and we need to understand that. And it, we, we're, not, we're not getting it because we're putting this power in an outside God, and that God is within us just as much as it is as that God is out there. Uh, we are very powerful, much more powerful than we think we are, individually and collectively. So that's why it's so critically important that we understand this process, that we develop our knowledge so that we can uh, uh, change our ways to, to better everyone around us. Does that help you? Uh, okay. Some of these things, like you mentioned, death. It said that uh, death is something that we invented. <laughs> you know, it there's no such thing as death. It's illusion. Uh, and you talked about uh, forgiveness. Well, no, we, we're setting the stage, and we're thinking, well, what did I do to deserve this, etc. Well, we we need that experience, um, and which, which is what we come into. Um, Karma then is a cause and effect, or a cause and then consequences of whatever you have set into motion. Uh, mm -hmm. I have read also that it's possible to um, ameliorate the karma, even in one's lifetime. If you change your thought, you change your action. 
so uh, to um, uh, to change that karma of long ago or whatever you set into motion, even in that same lifetime. Uh, it can be done if there's some type of acknowledgement or awareness of the wrongdoing and then a correction in terms of thought, word, and action. Is, is that according to HPV also? Generally, that is true. However, there are certain categories and, uh, that, that, you know, we have lectures on karma. But if you set something in motion, uh, basically you got to live it out. And certainly, you can mitigate uh, the consequences based on how how you react to that karma that you put into motion. But depending depending on the stage of which you put it in motion, uh, you can maybe totally mitigate it or only mitigate it to a degree. You've just got to got to bear with it and live it out. Yeah. Um. Settling of karmic accounts uh, and the law of karma apparently uh, exists uh, throughout. Um, and so something that's done in another life experience um, uh, and is, is accounted for in another life experience. And so in that second life experience, you say, if you stop to ask why, why is this happening to me? Uh, you may not know, but it more than likely is something that you need to be more aware of as being something that's a settling of an account, a karmic account. Okay. Now, I think the question that you're asking is, you know, can you avoid that? Can you avoid that uh, situation <coughs> of settling the account by doing something good or doing something else to uh, avoid the consequence of that negative action. Uh, and I've always understood that to be yes, you, that can happen if you are vibrating at a higher level than you were at the time when you put this thing out there. It mm -hmm. is possible if you've done some work to be able to be at a different level <laughs> so that when that comes around instead of you being there to settle that account, that account gets settled because of where your, the level that you've reached. I, I would not want to say that we can avoid our karma. No, we can't do it. To, to a degree, we can, we can change the attitude of our mind and, and, and see that as a challenge and, and an opportunity to learn. Well, let, let, me, let me put it this way. If, if you deal with it from the physical uh, definition of karma, which is cause and effect. If, um, if I deal with you in a, in a coarse manner, um, and um, that has an effect on you, um, is, is, isn't it possible that if I, if I also dealt with you in a more um, friendly manner, that the effect that that would have on you would be different than the effect that mm -hmm that I put out there to begin with. If I put a negative of cause out there, mm -hmm. you've got a negative effect, okay? But mm -hmm. I, I was able, in this same lifetime, to come back to you with a different cause to bring about a different effect. Absolutely. Okay, so. But, but if, let's say these two incidences, that's all I know about you. You come, up, you come at me one day and with something and I didn't, you know, that uh, was unpleasant, okay? And it affected me in a certain way. Well, until you come back to me with a friendly, in a friendly manner, it's affected me in that way. Right. Okay. And yeah, it's certainly mitigating the karma. No question. Okay. Okay. That, that's not really what I want to talk about. Okay. I want to get to. Uh, I want to make a comment here. Yeah. Events are recorded. They do not just disappear. Whatever we think, whatever we say. Whatever we do are recorded on that Akashic record and it cannot be eliminated. That one event is separate in its effect, so to speak, from the other event. That all that negativity that it created does just does not disappear because the 
Buddha that gave a subtle karma said, when you throw a pebble into the water in a lake, mm -hmm. it opens up and mm -hmm. opens up all the way. It goes to the shoreline of that lake. It affects all of the water in that lake. So that feeling we put out is not just affecting him. Even though nobody heard it. It, it is recorded. It affects all of the Akashic record, totality of the record of humanity. We are interlinked. None of us are separate entities. We are in, as individuals, but our activity, our thoughts are united. It's all recorded, and everybody feels it. It's not just him feeling it. And, and once you put it into effect, it will go out in larger circles, and it will spread itself to the world, because that Akashic record is total humanity. It's not portion. So, yes, you suppose we kill somebody. Uh, and now you're, we are saying we can mitigate that. How would we mitigate by removing that person's chance of experience in that life? Even though the karma is linked, he wouldn't have received it if we didn't do something together before. Because it's the effect coming to him in this life. But that doesn't mean that it was the correct action on the other person, because there could have been other things that could be could perhaps be done <coughs> to prevent that soul losing its body in this life, because the soul cannot experience it. Please let me finish. Yeah. The soul cannot experience life without going through the experiences of that lifetime. So his life got sh cut short. How can we mitigate that? Okay. Perhaps we go and talk to the family, apologize for the misdeed we have conducted, uh, do charity on behalf of humanity, but it doesn't change that the specific event that mm -hmm. took place. We can mitigate it to some degree uh, by taking an oath that we will conduct ourselves, not in that manner, by changing our ideology in believing that you come back, you're going to come back and <laughs> face your actions <laughs> of a previous life, whether you know it or not. So it is better to acknowledge that you know it and then go from that viewpoint in mitigating the circumstances. But the event is recorded. The ha person lost that opportunity for that lifetime. So we will come back and face it. And sometimes in childhood, people die. And we say, what on earth did he do to deserve that? The poor kid is only two years old and has leukemia. But the leukemia did not come to that uh, child out of nothing. It is perhaps from a previous um, karmic uh, occurrence that it comes. Because the soul is old. It has lived many, many lifetimes. But the body is young. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it gets into all the other things too. Being age of the karma, individual. There's a lot of uh, factors involved there. Maybe the parents the needed parents that experience. Um, yeah, okay. I had yeah. several hands going up over here. Um, no, Vera, sure. you, you had your chance once, so we can go for a second. Um, Einstein said that uh, no solution can be found from the same level of, con of uh, consciousness. From the what? Same, same level, level of consciousness. Of consciousness. Uh -huh. Yeah. Say Which that is again, please, uh, No solution to a problem can be found from the same level of consciousness. No solution to a problem can be found from, from the, the same, same level of consciousness. Yes. I'm not sure what that means. Exactly yeah. what you said. <laughs> exactly what it means. Wow, well, yeah. that, that was shorter than that. So <laughs> I like this better but, than the but one. Two of the two of them together, I might have not understood all that in-depth thing if it had it not been for both of you making those comments. Yes. Okay, I, I got it. Did you have something there? Well, um, I guess so. I guess the point is that what you're saying is that you cannot avoid settling your karmic debt. Yeah. There's no way to avoid that. That's going to happen. But you but you have control over how you do it. Okay. All right. I wanted to get to what I was really interested in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is and that is that is the process of reincarnation. I'm, I'm not talking about the, oh, the cycle. 
Well, it won't probably won't show up on the video then. So turn it off and turn it back on.